Hello. This sermon is called Quarantined with Ferengi, a biblical defense of the stay-at-home orders. It is based on the book of Numbers, chapter 12, and I will be reading chapter 12, verses 10 through 16. <coughs> when the cloud went away from over the tent, Miriam had become leprous, as white as snow, and Aaron turned towards Miriam and saw that she was leprous. Then Aaron said to Moses, O oh, my Lord, do not punish us for a sin that we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like one stillborn whose flesh is half consumed when it comes out of its mother's womb. And Moses cried out to the Lord, O oh God, please heal her. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp for seven days, and after that she may be brought in again. So Miriam was shut out of the camp for seven days, and the people did not set out on the march until Miriam had been brought in again. After that, the people set out from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. I have ADD. Back at divinity school, during my Old Testament hermeneutics class, it manifested one day when we were going through the Torah, or Pentateuch, uh, the first five books of the Bible. We had just finished up with Leviticus. And next thing I knew, the professor was starting to talk about Deuteronomy. Started to panic. What happened to Numbers? Did I zone out for an entire lecture? Possibly. I'm missing something here, but I was too embarrassed to ask. However, I was not alone. Someone else asked about numbers, and it turned out that he did cover it. I had zoned out, but many of us had missed it. He repeated his lecture. Numbers. Oh, and, and he was um, this big Irish guy. Let's see if I can do the accent justice. Numbers. Lots of boring lists. Lots of wandering in the desert. And lots of complaining. Now, don't get me wrong. Those lists are important. They are the reason that we know what the tabernacle looks like and other aspects of worship look like. And there was a lot of census data. It is not exactly a riveting read. I remember the first time I read it, uh, I was a kid and it was such a slog to get through. So many lists, hence the name Numbers. So it's kind of rare to find something in the often neglected book of Numbers that the Spirit has moved me to raise up and to speak on. This selection speaks to me, it speaks to what we are currently going through right now during the COVID-19 pandemic so perfectly. Chapter 5 is short, so I'm going to talk about the whole chapter thing. Um, I'm going to talk about the whole thing for context before focusing on the critical verse. In short, it starts with a spat between siblings. We have Moses. We all know Moses. Uh, burning bush, let my people go, parted the reed sea, received the Ten Commandments. And then there was Aaron. This is Moses' older brother, who helped Moses with Pharaoh and became the high priest of Israel. Then uh, there was Miriam. She's the older sister to both of them. She helped with the exodus out of Egypt, and according to the Talmud, she was one of the seven major prophetesses of Israel. So they are having an argument over Moses' Cushite wife. At first glance, it's easy to assume 
that this is something negative about his wife, about Moses marrying an inadequate person. However, according to the Midrash, it is because Moses, it is because Moses has separated from his wife, neglecting his husbandly duties. You see, calling someone a Cushite was a compliment. They were saying that his wife was an outstanding person. Their argument with Moses is that he was in self-imposed celibacy as a way to maintain a prophetic state. However, Aaron and Miriam were able to maintain their prophetic state while maintaining their marital relations. Now God heard this and he came down to rebuke them God's self because Moses was modest in personality and if you're the youngest sibling, you probably get what Moses is going through and feeling as his older brother and older sister are ganging up on him. Then here comes the critical part. Miriam is struck with leprosy. Now I know it's not fair that only Miriam is struck and not Aaron as well, but that, that's what we have to deal with. Um, so she's, she's uh, struck with leprosy, a highly contagious condition. And what, and what did the entire community of Israel do? They stopped right where they were immediately. Remember, the entire nation of Israel is in the desert, leaving Egypt and slavery behind them and going forward to the promised land. It was important to keep moving, right? But they all stopped because one of them was sick enough to need to be quarantined. Just one. And their society stopped, sheltered in place, and waited for Miriam, Miriam to be completely well again. Can you imagine that? Being a part of that group, fleeing forced servitude and heading towards a new home promised by God, but then you have to stop and wait for a quarantine to run its course. And everyone is okay with that. I know this because because this is the book of Numbers. And in this book, when it's not listing measurements of things or census stuff, it's mostly about the people complaining, describing them as murmuring whenever something happened that they did not like which was honestly pretty often, but there was no murmurings here. The Spirit has moved me towards this story from the often ignored book multiple times a day as I watch the news and other sources of current events. I wanted to start off these videos with selections from my sermon archives, but the Spirit had other plans for me. You know how that goes. Well, and uh, she would not let me move forward with the archive until I spoke about this. Now, setting aside the failures of the current federal leadership to respond or even lead for a topic for another day, Look at the government officials putting economy over human lives and those paid for protests being staged in state capitals wherever the narcissist thinks he can gain a political advantage. It has been greatly upsetting seeing my friends who are essential workers, especially those who are nurses and CNAs, being worn down and treated as if they were just disposable cogs and the death toll continues to, to mount around the world, especially here. Bulldozers dig mass graves to deal with the sheer numbers of deaths. But those anti-quarantine protesters want to go get a haircut. Nursing homes are being devastated, including the one that I was once a resident of, and also their staff who spend every day caring for our loved ones, watching them and their co-workers 
get sick and die. But some anti-quarantine protesters want to go out and buy grass seed. People without hazard level compensation are forced into situations where they are exposed to this deadly contagion that they would then bring home to their families or else they lose everything. But those protesters, they want to go to spring break or go bowling. I was floored by how selfish and callous those protesters are acting. To them I say, this isn't about you. It's about all of us together. Your protests blocking healthcare workers and ambulances are even worse. Your arguments ring hollow when it leads even indirectly to people dying because access to a hospital is prevented. Then there are the armed protesters. Yes, you have the right to carry, but why there? Why is it necessary? What does a pandemic, a worldwide health emergency, have to do with your arms? Now, I am not entirely anti-gun. I was a Boy Scout, and I am a better than average shot with a rifle. But I am pro-acting responsibly. Showing up fully armed, screaming, standing above a legislative session, they're not fooling anyone. They are trying to intimidate by threat of violence. At best, they are thugs. At worst, terrorists. I do not want to get too scattershot, but I feel it would be remiss not to mention the racial aspect. Last time something anywhere close to this happened, but was by African Americans, it was the Black Panthers in Sacramento in 1967, and they were treated differently. And I'll post the link in the, uh, in the description for that full story. Then there are the government officials. We have federal, state, and local executives whom the economy and whom they put their faith above that of human lives. Warnings ignored, causing more deaths because they didn't want to risk the holy market. They would fit right in among the Ferengi. You know, from Star Trek, the, the race of aliens with the ears, whose entire existence revolves around the pursuit of profit. Well, they would see these officials as kindred spirits who also follow the rules of acquisition. Now, it is also worth noting that they were written, uh, the Ferengi, they were written in Deep Space Nine as a satirical representation of 20th century humans. But, all right, but um, there's, there's the Texas Lieutenant Governor calling on senior citizens to sacrifice themselves upon the altar of capitalism. That is awful, but it gets worse. Recently, a city official in Antioch, California was removed from office for his posts on social media stating that we should adopt herd mentality, allowing the sick the old, the injured, to meet its natural course in nature, he said. He then added, quote, the homeless and other people who just defile themselves by either choice or mental issues, end quote, should be allowed to perish as this, quote, would fix what is a significant burden on our society and resources that can be used, end quote. How about we adopt agape? The divine love for one another as Jesus teaches us. Because of the defilement, because the only defilement and burden on society I see are the cruel and the ungodly who are in positions of power and influence, yet either 
do nothing to help their fellow humans, people like our narcissist president, his, his son-in-law, and a number of governors too weak to do their constitutional duty to see to the health and welfare of those in their states or those who are actively working against the greater good, following their perverse faith in the almighty dollar to help only a few who can already help themselves, people like the U.S. Senate Majority Leader and many others who follow him. This is the time for all of us to rise to the occasion. We are all in a bad place. But if you are better off and able to help others, your neighbors, you should. In the wake of the last national catastrophe back on September 11th, I saw so many signs that said, United we stand, divided we fall. It was true then, and it's even more true now. I could ask you to consider, what would Jesus do? We know the answer to that. He would do what he could to help relieve any suffering doing all he is able to do. And we know that's a lot. But let's tweak that question a little. What would you do for Jesus? In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, he tells us that any time we do anything for anyone, we are doing it for him. If you have committed to follow Jesus and are able, what can you do to help your neighbors? The options are endless. For example, you can call to make sure people are okay. Like how in the news it was reported that Shaq was calling his neighbors to check up on them. Can you imagine that? Just, hey, there's Shaq. Now, if you are so moved, just Google how you can help in your area. I, I did that, and, and lots of things pop up. And because every place is different, it is best, uh, and it is best what your local needs are to meet those. And there are always food banks. Uh, there are always food banks in need of food, and there are also morale-boosting activities that can be organized. When we work together towards a common goal, no matter in what capacity, things get done and things get better. I saw a GIF recently on Facebook. Uh, it was traffic camera footage of a minor accident involving a truck transporting what looked like eggs, just little, little round white things, but they didn't seem to break and they're rolling all over. Um, now, I'm talking eggs rolling all over a busy city intersection. Pedestrians and motors, motorists, they rushed, they rushed in towards the dazed man sitting amongst the carnage. Now some are seeing the him, but others start picking up eggs and putting them back into crates, and others are then moving the crates out of the road to the side. They make quick work of the mess that was blocking traffic, and then everyone was able to carry on with their day. Now, doesn't that sound like a better strategy than sacrificing tens of thousands for the sake of a few? As an American citizen, I support freedom of religion. As a commissioned interfaith chaplain, I recognize the validity of other religions. And as a Congregationalist, I believe in the freedom of conscience. So I am tolerant of other faiths and practices, even no faith. But I draw the line on whether it is valid when there is a body count attached. Those human Ferengi praying to their unholy trinity of the great economy, the almighty dollar, and the holy market are not who should be making such important decisions who would abandon thousands of our brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, cousins, parents and children to die for the sake of their stock portfolio. That is their faith, as if inspired by the rules of acquisitions. But I say that there is a better path, 
a faithful path, following the teachings of Jesus to show divine, selfless love for one another and inspired by the examples in the Bible. Remember, the only time that Jesus flipped tables, it was because so-called religious people were putting money over the well-being of their neighbors. And like the Israelites in the desert in today's selection, who stopped their entire society for the sake of one person while she went through a quarantine, together as a society, they knew the importance of what they had to do. They would not abandon one of their own. They did what they had to do, and they didn't even murmur. Ask yourself, which is better, the lonely, selfish path woven through the dead or the path where we are all in this together? Stay home, stay safe. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Loving God, in these trying times, we need your comfort more than ever. Send us the strength we need to keep the faith to be mindful of our neighbors and to do what we need to do. Send us your word to remind us what is truly important and send us your spirit to bring us together while we must be distant. So say we all. Thank you and I hope you enjoyed.